Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Jody Guest. I am an infectious disease epidemiologist, professor and vice chair of the Department of Epidemiology at Rollins School of Public Health here at Emory University. I lead Emory's COVID-19 outbreak response team working in harder hit communities across the state of Georgia. And it is my pleasure to be the host for Emory's COVID-19 Facebook Live events. And today we're going to be talking about the new masking guidance from CDC. I'm very pleased to be joined by Dr. Anish Mehta. Dr. Mehta is an Associate Professor of Medicine in the Infectious Disease Division at Emory School of Medicine. He is also the Assistant Director of the Transplant Infectious Disease Section and Chief of the Infectious Disease Services at Emory University Hospital. He's um, as well, he's also the Chief at Emory's Orthopedic and Spine Hospital for Infectious Diseases. Dr. Mehta is also a member of the Serious Communicable Diseases Unit at Emory University Hospital. So good afternoon, Dr. Mehta, and thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me, and pleasure to be on today. Great. We are going to um, be diving into these new CDC guidance on masking, but first let's give the background of where we are on COVID-19 in the United States, including our vaccination rates. The U.S. has almost 33 million cases of COVID-19 when we're currently averaging 35,000 cases a day. This continues our really good trend downwards where we're seeing a 23% decrease in cases since last week's average. In the last week, states with the highest rates of cases are Colorado, Alabama, Minnesota, Washington, Florida, and Oregon. Death rates and hospitalizations continue to also fall, which is a very clear sign that vaccinations are working. The US has now vaccinated more than 158 million people across the United States, and we are averaging about 2 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines being administered per day. 60% of the adult population has now received at least one dose of a COVID-19 vaccine and 48% are fully vaccinated. And this is a group we're gonna be talking a lot about today. 73% of the US population over the age of 65 are now also fully vaccinated, which is a tremendous accomplishment. 38% of the total US population is now fully vaccinated. And we need to remember that when we talk about vaccination rates, until recently, these did not include anyone under the age of 16, and now they go down to the ages of 12. Um, 12 to 15 year olds began their vaccinations last week due to the new emergency use authorization amendment for Pfizer in this age group. It is important to point out that our vaccination rates are not consistent across the United States, and Mississippi and Alabama currently have the lowest vaccination rates in our country. I wanna stress again that vaccinations are working and they are protecting those who have received vaccinations from COVID-19 from both being hospitalized and dying. It is because of these incredible vaccines the CDC changed their masking guidance last week. And that's where we're, we're going to focus our time today, Dr. Mehta. So before we tease out the specifics about these guidelines, it's important to recognize we're going to be talking about fully vaccinated people. And this means everyone who's received their second dose of the COVID-19 vaccination in our 14 days past that, if you got a Pfizer or Moderna vaccine, or your 14 days past your one dose of a Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So starting there, Dr. Mehta, I'm gonna to read to you the first statement of the guidance and let's talk about that. It says that fully vaccinated people can resume activities they did prior to the pandemic without wearing a mask or staying six feet apart, except where required by federal, state, local, tribal, or territorial laws, rules, regulations, including local businesses and workplace guidance. So first of all, that's a long sentence, but second of all, what are your first thoughts about this before we jump into more specifics? Well, as you mentioned, it's really exciting that we have these very successful vaccines and we're building up data showing these vaccines are very effective in the real world at decreasing the rates of significant COVID infections. And when communities have high rates of vaccination, we're really seeing uh, sustained decreases in that rate of infection. And so I think that's what the CDC based uh, these guidelines off of. And we're excited to see that. Um, I think the statement does reflect that new data and sort of the increased rate of vaccine. It does become a little bit difficult to interpret um, for everybody in every situation. 
I would say that the final part of that statement is, is something that's key to remember. And even if we're fully vaccinated, we need to be adherent to the local laws and regulations that are generally well thought out and, and put together by our public health experts. So public health experts in each locale figure out what the best advice is for their current situation. And so while federal guidance is helpful, we need to uh, listen to our local public health experts. I think, again, um, it's not recommending that you don't wear a mask. And you and I have talked about this and many others have talked about this. It is saying that we can feel a little bit more comfortable if we cannot wear a mask or not uh, have that mask available, but you can still wear the mask. And many of us will continue to wear the mask, particularly if we're in areas that have low vaccination rates. Thank you so much for pointing that out. And I'm gonna reiterate a bunch, a little bit of that because I don't think we can overstate it. These guidelines are clearly based on science for individuals and your protection from the vaccines. And they show that if you're fully vaccinated, your risk for acquiring and spreading COVID-19 is really very, very small if, if you're fully vaccinated. But these guidelines are a bit harder to interpret at the population level, and that's where we're going to need guidance from state and local health departments. These guidelines also do not state you should remove your mask. They instead are meant to be an assurance that if you've been fully vaccinated, you can feel safe in situations because of your vaccines. So um, we're going to move for a moment to a little bit of show and tell, and I'm going to show CDC's Safer um, Activities spreadsheet that lists the um, guidance for those who are fully vaccinated and for those who are not. Um, this guidance states that you're safe to do almost any activity if you're fully vaccinated inside or outside without a mask, um, but they they they're really about just you being there and that guidance. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna share the screen and let's talk through a few of these. We're gonna start with the outdoor settings where you see, as you look at this, if you're fully vaccinated, you're pretty safe, it appears, for any activity outdoors without a mask. Dr. Mehta, what's your interpretation um, and additional thoughts on that? Yeah, and I think, again, as we've talked about before, outdoor activities are generally safer when we talk about any communicable diseases, but particularly things like COVID. And I think a lot of these uh, guidance in this infographic is helpful. I would point out one thing uh, that you and I have talked about, the, the second line um, or the second row, where, it's, where you'd be attending a small outdoor gathering uh, with fully vaccinated friends and family. On the left, you see an unvaccinated individual. And therefore, if that individual was attending that event, it would uh, then preclude the actual situation that is described here, because then everybody's not vaccinated. And while it might be safe for that one individual who's unvaccinated to attend an event where everybody else is vaccinated, it then becomes less safe for the fully vaccinated individuals. And so therefore this situation doesn't exist. And I would refer to the third row where that unvaccinated individual, if they're attending one of these events, should be masked. And if everyone else is vaccinated, then it is reasonably safe for them to have an outdoor activity together. But the other difficulty, and this has been what we've been talking about in our families, here at work, is that it's difficult to know who is vaccinated and who is unvaccinated. And it can sometimes be uncomfortable to ask the situation. So I think the default position throughout these uh, uh, guidance is that if it's unknown, if everyone you're around is vaccinated, then it's still safer to be wearing a mask. Thank you. I think that's actually a, a point worth repeating, if you don't mind. If you're an event that you don't know the vaccine status of everyone there, Dr. Mehta, what is your recommendation? So if indoor events, definitely wearing a mask for outdoor events, for large gatherings where you don't know people who are unvaccinated, it's still safer to wear a mask. Thank you for that. Let's move to indoors. Um, and as we look at this, all the different scenarios, if you're fully vaccinated, all of these scenarios are considered on, this, on the very safe side to be unmasked for a fully vaccinated person. Do these assume that we don't have unvaccinated people there as well? 
So yes, Jody, I think the assumption here is that there, uh, there are not vaccinated or high risk people in that, in that event. And so again, it is, you should feel safe and much safer where, um, now that you're fully vaccinated, but it's still safer if you wear a mask when you don't know the situation of those that are around you. And if you look on the left side, it clearly states on the CDC guidance, that these activities are less safe for the unvaccinated, even if they are wearing a mask. So that does indicate our indoor situations where we have mixed populations of vaccinated and unvaccinated individuals. While on the individual level, it's really easy to understand the risk. As you mentioned, when we're talking about the whole group, it becomes a little more difficult to understand the full risk. So if you were to attend a, um, a worship service or go to any other larger indoor events, you're fully vaccinated, would you wear a mask? For indoor events, uh, my family and I, we are continuing to wear a mask, um, not only for the protection of ourselves, but we have elderly members of our family. I take care of immunocompromised uh, people. Uh, we have two children at home that um, are just getting ready to be uh, uh, vaccinated. They won't be fully vaccinated for at least another month. And so we wanna make sure they're protected as well. And that's another difficulty of these guidelines is it doesn't fully yet incorporate what to do when you're fully vaccinated, but you're living with uh, children who cannot yet be vaccinated. It's an excellent point. And um, let's take a moment to talk about your kids. They are not in the 12 to 15 year old range that can now get vaccinated. How, are, how did they get vaccinated? I think this is wonderful. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, so uh, I'll tell you a quick story. My uh, seven year old um, had months ago asked for a skateboard and I gave that as a potential reward when she eventually got vaccinated. So she heard about uh, the study that was going on at CHOA. So she and I uh, wrote an email that she dictated to me to the research team at CHOA, at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. And um, we put our names on the list and uh, not to be outdone by her younger sister, then my, her uh, older sister wanted to be on the list too. And so yesterday they got called in for the Kid Cove study, which is the uh, study of the Moderna vaccine uh, for uh, children that are less than 12 years of age. And so they both got their vaccine and they're super excited about it. They both wanted to go back to school after the vaccine. And in fact, my older daughter won three uh, basketball games, uh, these little games that they play uh, similar to basketball at the school. And so all the kids in her class are now calling it the energy shot, which I thought was really exciting. That's fantastic. And, and well done to your kids. I love that this was their idea. You know, it really goes back to the idea of let the younger people lead us, mm -hmm. right? And so your kids are are leading um, us. And in, in, in the state of Georgia, it's really important with our vaccination rates being as low as they are that we um, take advantage of everyone who is now ready and interested in being vaccinated. Um, I do want to point out, talking about Georgia, that only 29% of our state is fully vaccinated. So as we looked at those CDC guidelines, more than two thirds of our state are falling into the category of unvaccinated and really don't have any indoor activities that are safe without a mask um, and safe for those that they live with and their question, um, their children, et cetera. Um, for a moment, let's talk about uh, schools and do these recommendations, the new ones from the CDC, do they change the way we should be thinking about masking in our K through 12 schools? So I think currently the guidance on the CDC website, or I should say the CDC guidance um, for schools on, on the website does indicate that it's still safest to wear masks in schools. And again, in schools, we have uh, children that have been vaccinated. We have children who haven't been vaccinated. We have children that cannot yet be vaccinated because of their age group. And so in that situation where there is that possible interaction, um, it is safest uh, to continue to wear a mask. Um, and I think most schools uh, still have those rules. And it's important, as we mentioned, those rules are developed by public health experts that understand the situation of those schools. And so therefore it's important to follow those locally developed public health guidance. 
And it's, it's very possible that if we see vaccination rates, particularly among 12 to 15 year olds, really accelerate this summer, we may see changes in that from CDC as guidance for the fall. We have enough time to see movement in those guidelines if we get vaccinations, um, continue to see rapid increases in vaccination rates. Yes, I think that's the great hope for many of us parents is that if we get more of our children vaccinated, then they can return to school in the fall and go back to what life was like, hopefully soon um, after returning in fall to what it was before the pandemic. And they'll get their energy shot and start to win their basketball games. <laughs> um, it is also important to note that these new guidelines do not change the way people should be masking when they are in a healthcare facility, including visiting their clinician. So if I were to come in and visit you, Dr. Meta, I would need to be wearing my mask regardless of my vaccine status, correct? That is correct. So here at Emory Healthcare, as well as multiple other healthcare uh, systems that I've spoken with over the past several days, we're all going to continue to be wearing our mask, whether we're healthcare providers, patients, or visitors when we're in, in clinical settings. And that's because we uh, have patients that are not yet vaccinated because of their medical conditions, or they're immunocompromised. And we need to make sure in that healthcare environment that we're doing everything we can to protect the vulnerable. Thank you. Um, and let's move to a little bit of travel and how the guidelines have been updated for those who are fully vaccinated with travel. It's important to note that we still have um, the need to wear masks on our planes, buses, trains, and other forms of public transportation across the United States. These guidelines do not change that. So if you're leaving home and you're fully vaccinated, it's probably safest for you to continue to have a mask with you. Um, additionally, businesses can make their own decisions about masking. And so you might um, find yourself at the entrance of a business that is saying you need to have a mask with you. So um, make sure you still continue to carry one. Let's talk about travel. What are the domestic policies now for people who are fully vaccinated? So I think one of the exciting additions, um, and we've been moving this direction for a little while, is that if you are fully vaccinated, as you mentioned, 14 days from the second mRNA vaccine or 14 days from the Johnson Johnson vaccine, first vaccine, then you are considered fully protected and you no longer have to get tested before or after travel. And you don't need to do self-quarantining if you're staying in the United States. So I think that's a really important addition for those particularly that need to do travel for business, um, but also potentially for leisure travel as well as we move into the summertime. Another really a nice addition um, if we're fully vaccinated. Now, for international travel, the situation is a little different um, because there are uh, countries that you may travel to that are having uh, much larger surges than what we're having here in the United States. They also may have their own rules and regulations. So it's really important to keep uh, aware of the situation in the countries that you're traveling to and look at their guidance as far as when you enter and leave the country. Thank you. So if you are traveling internationally, you do actually need a negative test to get back into the United States, or you need to show you've recently had COVID-19. And it's still recommended you get tested um, three to five days after you're back, but you don't have to self-quarantine during that time. So big improvements on that as far as mobility. Um, now, the other thing that changed with the guidelines or that's newer to the guidelines is what happens if I as a fully vaccinated person have had an exposure to a person who's known to have COVID-19, do I now need to quarantine the way we've had in the recommendations previously? So uh, with the updated guidance, if you've been around someone with COVID-19 uh, and you're fully vaccinated, you in general would not need to quarantine. Now there are some exceptions to that. If you work in um, sort of high density working settings like a correctional facility, um, or in a healthcare facility, homeless shelter, those sort of high density situations, you may still need to um, follow the local rules um, and potentially get tested even if you do not have symptoms. If you are in that situation, it is the best, uh, I think our best advice 
is to, again, check with your healthcare provider and your local experts as to what you should do in that situation. So we get a little more freedom, um, even if we're exposed when we're fully vaccinated. But again, for the protection of those that you're around, be thoughtful about the situation you're coming back to. Right. Um, there's also a conversation about um, if I have a mask on, am I assumed to be an unvaccinated person? And what, you know, how are people going to interpret that? So um, in full honesty, I went to the grocery store yesterday. I'm fully vaccinated. I had my mask on. Um, I actually am great with people knowing I'm fully vaccinated. I'm also great with people knowing I'm fully vaccinated and still want to wear my mask. There's a lot of shaming going on in this country about masking and vaccination rates. Can you talk about how um, not helpful that is for us moving forward in the pandemic? Of course. And I think, again, this goes to the unfortunate uh, movement of masking policies and masking um, sort of behavior from sort of a public health uh, arena to more of a political arena. Um, but again, if, if we're thinking about this as a public health measure, a measure for us to protect each other and be part of uh, uh, helpful members of our community, then we sh should never uh, feel guilty or make anyone feel guilty for wearing a mask. And many other cultures, it's, it's pretty routine for people to wear a mask when they're out and about. And I think actually in the United States, we'll see more of that moving forward. Um, I, like you, when I go to the grocery store or the pharmacy, will wear a mask uh, for the protection reasons that we've already talked about. Um, I'm also very okay for people to know that I'm vaccinated. I wear a button on my uh, white coat uh, when I round in the hospital because I want people to know I'm vaccinated. Right. Um, but I do think that it is, it is a reasonable behavior and we shouldn't feel bad for wearing masks. We shouldn't assume that people who are wearing masks are vaccinated or unvaccinated either way. Right. And again, just to repeat, these guidelines are really about how great the science is and the data are about vaccinations and how well they're working. They are not a, a free for all for everyone to take off their masks. That's not what they were intended to do, although it is hard sometimes when you see you know, titles of articles going across on your social media to um, only read that. Um, let's turn for a moment to some of the benefits of um, vaccination. And a, a really common question is if you're immunocompromised or taking immunosuppressant medications, how well vaccinations work in you, for you? And is it different um, in its efficacy compared to someone who is not immunocompromised? Oh, that's a great question. And something I talk to my patients and my colleagues about every day. Um, as we know that patients who are immunocompromised or taking immunosuppressive medicines, whether it be for transplant, for um, cancers, or autoimmune diseases, they often don't respond to vaccines quite as robustly as people who are not on those medications. Um, however, most of our vaccines, including our COVID-19 vaccines, do offer some and sometimes very good level of protection um, uh, compared to not having the vaccine. So we are continuing to encourage our uh, transplant patients and other immunocompromised patients to receive their vaccines. We do know they'll get some benefit from it. And as we move forward, we'll understand better how much benefit and if we need to do anything different for them. But by the same token, I am recommending to all of our transplant and oncology cancer patients who are on chemotherapy to continue to wear a mask in situations where they may be exposed or don't know who's been vaccinated and not vaccinated for their own protection. That's wonderful. And is there any reason for the transplant for transplant patients who've been vaccinated to get an antibody, I'm sorry, yeah, an antibody test to see their level of protection or even look at their viral load level? Yeah, so that's a that's a really good question. Actually, I was just on a call about this uh, before I got on. It is it is a very hot topic. So, uh, if patients want to get their antibody check, they can, but we're not recommending it because there's no specific action that we would change or recommend for them, you know, depending on the antibody test. We do know that many uh, transplant patients will not get as high of a level of an antibody or not develop that antibody level as quickly as non-immunocompromised patients will. 
And we're not at this point in time recommending additional vaccines. It's actually not allowable under the current uh, FDA guidance. And we are continuing to recommend that in situations where the patients may be exposed for them to continue to wear a mask and really to encourage their, um, the people they're around to wear a mask. And finally, the most important message that we give to our immunocompromised patients is to really encourage their family members, loved ones, and those they're interacting with to get vaccinated because they can build their own herd immunity around themselves um, to protect them if those around them are fully vaccinated. Thank you. Um, let's, I've got two more questions before we run out of time. The first is about um, if I'm working in an office and I share an office with a person and we're both vaccinated, do we have a lot of risk if we're together, let's say eight hours a day? So that's a wonderful question. And, and again, something that is going on in conversations that are going on in every workplace right now. I think if every individual is vaccinated, the risk does go lower and we're starting to understand how that works. And so um, again, in the healthcare setting, we need to be much more cautious um, about that. In the non-healthcare settings, I think businesses are taking a look at whether um, they can figure out ways that people can uh, safely unmask at work. I think we'll see more guidance from the CDC in the coming weeks as we get more data on this. Um, and I think also it becomes an individual level decision. I think we need to be very respectful if we're in a group of people and even if everyone's vaccinated, if someone feels that they feel that they would be safer vaccinated, I, or sorry, safer masked, even if they're vaccinated, we should be respectful of that. And so if I'm in that situation and down the road, I start to feel more comfortable being unmasked, if one of my colleagues prefers to be masked, then I will be masking with them so that I we build that level of trust. And we can continue to do our work in a comfortable situation. Thank you. Um, okay, last, let's talk about breakthrough cases. Cer certainly the um, New York Yankees have made some news lately about eight, eight breakthrough cases. And um, while that might sound particularly ominous, it actually is a lot of data that, that we're looking at to say, look how great the vaccines worked. Mm -hmm. So to set it up, eight, um, one person in the New York Yankees had COVID-19 and, and was fully vaccinated and then seven more got it, probably from that one case. Talk about um, the potential for symptoms and, and what the symptoms look like in the people that um, had those breakout cases. Yeah, so that's a really interesting situation. And I'll point out one thing that the Yankees did active monitoring of mm -hmm. all their employees with that one case. And they found those seven other cases that were asymptomatic at the time and they had been uh, vaccinated. So, so that points out that the vaccines do work to decrease the risk of symptomatic COVID-19 and hopefully therefore uh, may contain the ability to spread the virus though we don't know that yet. Um, and then it also is important that it shows that these public health measures to, once you find a case, to go out and look for other cases work very well. So they found, um, so the public health measures work at finding the cases, and then the vaccines work because while those uh, seven people were positive, none of them got sick enough to seek, uh, to need medical care and were able to return back to uh, their activities uh, soon thereafter. So again, as you point out, this is a success because we prevented symptomatic disease, less burden on the healthcare system, and those people did not get sick. Right. And, you know, I think it's fair to also point out that if there wasn't routine screening, which by the way is fantastic, they would not probably have ever known those seven folks that they were a breakthrough case. And so it feels like that's a lot, but in actuality, most people are not getting routine testing like that. Um, so as I read it, it felt like it was very well handled and as actually a, a very positive attribute of what we're seeing with vaccination rates um, in, a, in a population like that. Well, Dr. Mehta, do you have any last thoughts um, back to our original topic of the CDC guidance and the masking that you want to leave everyone with? So I think this is showing us the success of our vaccine. So I encourage everyone to go out and get their vaccine. Talk to your healthcare provider if you have any questions about it, because it will be that herd immunity as we get more and more people vaccinated, 
vaccinated that we can start to dial down some of these restrictions that we've had to do. Wonderful. Dr. Mehta, thank you so much. Everyone out there, please continue to stay safe. If you're fully vaccinated, please feel free to continue to wear your masks in public. And if you're unvaccinated, please make sure you check out the guidelines for CDC um, to know specifically how you should be integrating into different populations and what you need to do to keep yourself and those you love safe. Please stay safe, safe everyone. Thank you for watching.